Welcome to the Terran Space Academy. It is our goal at the Academy to create and present educational materials to help you prepare for a future in the space industry. We want to do that in the format best suited to your learning style. Now as a scientist with a medical degree and an understanding of neuroscience, I know that people learn better when small chunks of pertinent information is presented clearly in a multimedia format. That is how we humans best absorb data. Some have noticed, however, that as our lectures, discussions, and courses have been created, I tend to talk a lot, and I speak very quickly at times. This seems to be the result of trying to cram all the important information you need to know into a short enough time period so as not to lose your interest. To better achieve our goals, this extremely important course will be broken up into several lessons where I will speak more clearly and a little slower giving you more time to absorb the important information. This course is meant to give you a full understanding of aneutronic fusion. Aneutronic fusion is why helium-3 on the moon will be so valuable in the future, and access to this power source will advance our civilization to the post-scarcity world we are all trying to build. If we cannot make space exploration economically viable, it will not be able to sustain itself. To this end, we will be starting with the fundamentals of fusion itself, the astrophysics of fusion. Understanding a neutronic fusion requires an understanding of neutronic fusion, also known as just plain regular fusion. To know how fusion works, we should go back to the beginning, the very beginning. In the beginning, there was a bang. It was big and good insofar as it allowed the existence of our world. At first there was only pure energy, an extremely dense collection of quarks, leptons, and gauge bosons called the primordial soup. The temperature of this soup was a mild 10 quintillion degrees or so. You would need a sunscreen. Space-time began to expand faster than the speed of light after only one nanosecond, and the primordial soup rapidly condensed into other forms of matter as it expanded and cooled. The quarks joined together to make hadrons like protons and neutrons. The protons, having a positive charge, started grabbing up negatively charged electrons to balance out and formed the simplest atom in the universe, hydrogen. Now some of the neutrons flying around locked onto protons by the strong nuclear force, which acts between quarks using gluons to transmit this force. A proton and a neutron and a nucleus make deuterium. Deuterium is a heavy form of hydrogen. Perhaps some nuclei had two neutrons and one proton, making tritium, the heaviest naturally occurring form of hydrogen. Tritium atoms are unstable, with a half-life of only 12 and a half years, and would have decayed into helium-3. Helium-3 is important to our subject, but we will come back to it. Larger atoms didn't form much at all because of the extreme heat and rapid expansion favoring hydrogen almost exclusively. This left a rapidly expanding universe of massive hydrogen clouds or nebula with about 3% helium. As these clouds cooled, their center of mass became the focal point for the gravitational energy created by their mass. When the temperature of the clouds became low enough that the gravitational energy of their mass overcame the thermal kinetic energy keeping them apart, and this is called Jeans Mass, and is named for Professor James Jeans of Great Britain. When this limit is reached, the cloud starts to contract. As it does, it heats up, as all compressing gases do. But this heat is radiated and lost into space as infrared energy. The cloud contracts more, heats up briefly, cools down as it radiates heat, then contracts some more. Eventually, the core of the cloud becomes very dense, with the hydrogen being compressed at unbelievable pressures and temperatures. The electrons are stripped off the hydrogen atoms, leaving bare protons or nuclei of protons and neutrons. As these nuclei are crammed close enough together from pressure and impact, the particles are able to exchange gluons, which are very short range, but very powerful. These gluons transmit the strong nuclear force and lock these particles together into a new nucleus, helium. This helium is not usually helium-3, it is helium-4. This is the type of helium we are most familiar with here on Earth, 
Helium was discovered in the spectrum of the sun because it is too light to stay in our atmosphere. Like hydrogen, it floats to the very top of the atmosphere of the Earth and is stripped away into space by the solar wind. We only find it here on Earth trapped underground from the decay of uranium. Here you can see the step-by-step -step process that hydrogen takes on its way to becoming helium-4 in the heart of a star. So this is fusion. Bare hydrogen nuclei are protons. Protons can be compressed together at over 4 million Kelvin and form helium with the addition of two neutrons. What actually happens is that two protons bind together to become a diproton. About 1 in 10 octillion times one of these diprotons decays into a neutron. This deuterium nucleus binds with another proton to become helium-3. Two helium-3 nuclei bind together to form helium-4 and eject two protons. At every step, the fusion product of the nuclei has a mass just a fraction less than the mass of the original particles, about 0.7% for hydrogen to helium fusion. But as Einstein made clear with E equals mc squared, this is still a tremendous amount of energy. As the helium is formed, two ultraviolet photons are emitted also. These collide with atoms in the interior and heat them up, causing them to emit photons of their own. It takes about 10,000 years for photons to finally stream from the core to the surface of the sun. Some of the hydrogen and helium can be ejected from the sun by solar winds, but the sun's massive gravity can hold on to most of it. The sun is not a very efficient fusion reactor, burning only a tiny fraction of the available hydrogen but this is enough to provide all the energy the sun radiates. This energy also expands the star and keeps it from collapsing under its own mass due to gravitational force. The size of the cloud that condensed into a star and how much material made it in before ignition determines the pressure and temperature at the core. A more massive star has a hotter core and burns the available fuel much faster than a smaller star. When all of the hydrogen is burned into helium, and this can take a trillion years if a star is small like a red dwarf, or it can take only a few thousand years if the star is supermassive, like the population one stars at the beginning of the universe. The nuclear fire dims and starts to collapse in on itself. This causes the heat and pressure at the core to climb rapidly. If conditions are right, the star will ignite a second phase of fusion. It will burn the helium into carbon. Helium-4 atoms have two protons and two neutrons. Combining three of the helium using the strong nuclear force gives the six carbons and six neutrons of carbon-12, the most common isotope of this element. The star converts its helium to carbon over millions of years. This process is faster than the hydrogen burning phase. When the core of carbon gets large enough and has not ignited, it comes under extreme gravitational compression. Things can get complicated, but essentially the star will then start fusing the carbon into neon, and then later the neon into oxygen, oxygen into silicone, and finally silicone into iron. Iron cannot fuse. Iron builds up in the core and means the death of any star. As the nuclear fire at the heart of the star goes out, the pressure around it can create shells that continue to fuse. The instant these go out, the outer shells, having been expanded against the force of gravity by the fusion energy, start to collapse back in and the massive gravitational force quickly accelerates them to almost the speed of light. These shells impact the iron core with the resulting explosion blasting all of these elements and heavier ones created in the immense explosion we call a supernova out into space. It is believed by most scientists that the elements making up our Earth are from a supernova in the constellation Cassiopeia. You can tell what population a star is by its metallicity. In this case, the astrophysicists refer to metallicity as how much of any metal above helium is in a star. So this would include lithium and on up the periodic table. So now we better understand the stars we will see so clearly once we are outside the Earth's atmosphere and the fusion process that keeps them burning. The next lesson will be on creating small stars on our world to power our civilization. As always, give us feedback, let us know if you have any questions, and thanks for listening.